Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Cheryl Reynolds. I'm with the UC Statewide IPM program. Welcome to the UC Ag Expert Talk on what's in your orchard, protecting California from invasive species. Peter Casina is also on the line and he'll be running our polls and doing any troubleshooting. And please note that the webinar is targeted to growers and pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but pest management methods presented, especially pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use by homeowners. And just a special thank you to the Citrus Research Board for their support of this webinar series. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Today we have Dr. Mark Hoddle. He's an extension and biological control specialist at UC Riverside. And today he'll be speaking on protecting California from invasive species. And so now we're gonna pass this over to Mark. So you can go ahead and share your screen. There we go. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So some of the things we're going to talk about, um, a few years ago, I finished up a big um, invasion statistics analysis with the California Department of Food and Ag. Some of you may know Bob Dell. I did this with him just before he retired. So we'll go over some of those invasion statistics, which are very specific to California. And we'll talk about the identity of some of those invasive pests that we identified through that uh, work. Um, we'll go over some of the things that we are doing to respond to some newly established pests in California. We'll briefly touch on work we're doing with the South American palm weevil. Um, basically, there's not a lot of management going on there, but I'll describe to you what impact that pest is having and why we see it as a major threat to California's date industry out in the Coachella Valley. And we'll talk about the Asian citrus psyllid and the biocontrol program we initiated against that pest. And um, what I'd like to discuss with you is something that we're developing here at, in my lab. It's called proactive biological control. And this is the idea of um, identifying invasive pests that are on the horizon, which are likely to come to California, but trying to get ahead of the problem before they actually arrive here in the state. And we'll use spotted lanternfly as an example of a proactive biocontrol program that we are currently running. We're also looking at avocado seed weevils, but that project's just started. and We've got more to talk about with the uh, spotted lanternfly project. And um, we'll wrap up with some, some conclusions. And actually, I have a couple of short videos sprinkled through this presentation. And I'm hoping we'll have time to see all of those. OK, so our invasive species problem. California has a lot of exotic arthropods. As of 2010, when uh, Bob and I finished uh, data mining, we estimated that we had over uh, 1,600 non-native arthropod species established in California. A lot of these you may be familiar with, shown over here on the uh, side of the screen, gold spotted oak, borer, glassy wing, sharpshooter, cottony cushion scales, been here since about 1888 or so, brown widow spiders, Argentine ants, and of course, Bacia mite on avocados. And about 20% of these invaders or non-natives that have established here have become pests. About 80% or so of them really don't seem to have caused any significant problems for us. So where do they come from? So Bob and I looked at about uh, 992 of these species and our data suggests quite strongly that about 44% of them actually come from populations that have established elsewhere in the United States or Canada. So they had not come directly into California from their countries of origin and we call these populations invasion bridgeheads where say, say for example, spotted lantern flights established widely now through Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and it's originally native to China. If it was to come to California, it's more likely that it would come from one of those populations that have established on the east coast of the United States. So if we look at the direct invaders, about 56% or so, uh, you can break those down by geographic region. So California's received about 25% of those 56% pests have come directly to us from Europe. And what was really interesting for, for me was that relatively few pests have come to California directly from Mexico, Central and South America, you know, only about two to 7% or a total of 9% of those pests. A larger number seem to have come to us directly from Asia, a few out of Africa, 
Australia and the South Pacific, but that's mainly Hawaii that we're considering there. But a large proportion of these have come to us directly from populations that have established elsewhere in the US or in Canada. So what are the identities of these invaders? Well, as many of you in agriculture and home gardeners are well aware, a, a large number of these invaders are sap sucking pests that have almost certainly been imported accidentally on plants. And the Hemiptera, which are specialized sap sucking pests, account for the largest proportion of these. And you'll be familiar with a lot of these families, aphids, scales, mealybugs, uh, leaf hoppers, soft scales, and of course, psyllids, like the Asian citrus psyllid. The next largest group are comprised of the beetles, mainly weevils and uh, staphylinids and some of the chrysomelid beetles. Then we drop down to Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies, mainly represented by the pyralids and tortricids. A few mites in the area of Phaeidae, the spider mites, the tetranicidae. Jump down here into the dip, uh, Hymenoptera. Um, most of you will be familiar with the invasive ant problems that we have. Argentine ant is a big one, fire ants. And then bringing in pretty much last place are the thrips. Again, small plant feeding bugs, very cryptic, hard to find during plant inspections. So Sandy Liebhold with the USDA Forest Service did a major study looking at all of the um, pests that have come in on, um, that are a problem, really basically a problem for forests. And his work concluded, similar to what Bob and I found, that live plant imports are a major conduit for the introductions of these unwanted insects. And in his case, he was looking at pathogens as well. So, and they also identified sap-sucking hemipterans as the most common pest that gets introduced. So those data were supporting the work that, that we were doing with the CDFA, which was great. So these invasions into California are, are accelerating. So we were able to look at our data set that, that we'd put together we figured out that California prior to 1989 was acquiring about six of these exotic arthropods each year. About one every 60 days was coming into the state and establishing. Then if we looked at the interval from 1989 to 2010 when we uh, stopped data mining, California was getting almost 10 non-native arthropods establishing in the state. There was an average of about one every 40 days. So we calculate that our rate of acquisition of these invasive pests is increasing, possibly by about 62% over the course of the data set that we looked at. So we're not the only ones that we uh, that have noticed this trend. Siebens and others back in 2017 in a Nature article indicated through their analyses that the world is still moving a lot of these species around and there seems to be no saturation in the accumulation of these non-native species that are being spread. So the rates of introduction, rates of establishment, they're not slowing down. There, there appears to be no plateauing in the graphs that they were producing. And this trend, interestingly, was consistent, not only for the mainlands, you know, big areas of land like, say, the United States or Australia or Europe, but even small oceanic islands didn't appear to be approaching uh, saturation with invasive species. And they concluded that trade is a major driver. And this is uh, coupled with increasing cultivation of non-native plants in agriculture and botanic and private gardens, which are all moving live plant material around uh, sources of plant pathogens, plant pests, and of course, weeds that escape these botanical and private gardens. Okay, so let's have a look at one of the recent invaders we've been dealing with. This is the South American palm weevil. It's a very large beetle, about two inches, two and a half inches in length. It's now California's largest weevil species. And we first found this in 2010 when I got a call to go down to Tijuana and look at some of these dead Canary Island date palms and scrounged around in the top of them and found this large black beetle, which was subsequently identified as the South American palm weevil. As its name suggests, it's native to South America, parts of Central America, the Caribbean, and the more tropical parts of Mexico. But despite this being a tropical palm pest, it's doing very well in our irrigated desert areas because we've provided them a lot of food and those palm trees are well watered and they seem to be doing just fine. So life cycle of these weevils, all the action occurs in the top of the palm tree in the apical meristem. That's the part or the palm heart that is at the top of the palm and it produces the new fronds. So these are long snouted weevils. This is actually a male, but uh, females have long noses too. And they use that snout to drill a hole into the top of the palm tree. Then the female lays these large eggs in that hole. 
that she's uh, drilled. Those eggs hatch into these large grubs, which can grow up to a couple of inches or more in length. And it's the feeding of large numbers of these larvae in the heart or the, the crown of the palm tree that kills that meristematic tissue. And that results in the fronds falling out of the palm. Sometimes the crown itself will drop completely off the palm tree onto the ground. And as these larvae get ready to pupate, they migrate out of the crown. They go to the bases of the fronds that are attached to the palm tree. They drill tunnels into the bases of those palm fronds. Once we're in those tunnels, they start gathering up these palm fibers and they spin them around their bodies to make these, you know, very tightly woven cocoons. And I've cracked open one of these cocoons and you can see a pre-pupil larva here. It's finished spinning the cocoon. It will then molt its skin one more time and enter the pupil stage. And you can see the wing pads here developed on the side of this pupa. That pupa, which is inside the cocoon, will molt its skin or shed, will undergo ectysis one more time, and then it'll take on the adult form, which looks like a beetle, a weevil with a long nose. And then at the very tip of that nose are the mandibles, which look like a couple of pincers, and they'll chew a hole through the end of the cocoon and they will emerge. These are long-lived beetles. The adults can live several months. The life cycle can take several months to complete, depending on the temperature. There are males and female weevils in the population, and the males are easily identifiable by looking on the top of the snout or the rostrum. Only the males have this, uh, these bristles or seti that sit on the top of the nose. The females lack these seti, and the nose is smooth looking. So easy to sex in the field because they're so big. So there are a lot of dead palm trees in Southern California now. In San Diego County alone, it's been estimated that more than 10,000 of these Canary Island date palms have been killed by the South American palm weevil. Here's a shot down at Imperial Beach where a long line of these Canary Island date palms, they're probably well in excess of 50 years old, have been killed by the palm weevil. Actually, there's no more trees here. They've all been killed and taken away now. So one of the other things we're worried about with um, South American palm weevil coming into California is that not only can the weevil kill the palm trees through larval feeding in the crown, but in the areas where this weevil is native, it vectors a nematode known as the red ring nematode because when palms are infected, they end up with this characteristic red ring that develops in the, in the trunk of the palm. And I don't know why it's red and I don't know why it's perfectly circular. But the weevils are responsible for vectoring these nematodes from palm tree to palm tree. And they can kill these palms within about six to 20 weeks post-infection. And it, there are a significant problem in, especially in Costa Rica, where they have a large oil palm industry. This is probably a significant impediment to the economic um, viability of, of growing palm, oil palms in Costa Rica. And they have very aggressive weevil control programs. So even if your palm tree became infected with South American palm weevil, and you managed to kill it off through, say, applying systemic insecticides, if that tree has been inoculated with red ring nematode, it is still going to die. We have no, at this point, we've got no effective nematicides to use against red ring nematode should it show up here in California. The good news is, it doesn't appear to be in the United States at this time. However, it is known from Mexico. And when you dive into that a little deeper, I have not yet really found out whereabouts in Mexico it is. There are no reports of it from Tijuana where we first found South American palm weevil. But as we have seen with Asian citrus psyllid, for example, we get the vector first, it's around for several years, and then eventually the pathogen that that vector spreads shows up. So. It may just be a matter of time before red ring nematode shows up in California and we have a weevil that kills the palm trees and then we have a nematode or uh, that that weevil spreads, which is also capable of killing palm trees. So we could end up with a double whammy from that one pest. So a question I get asked a lot is like, well, okay, this is a really serious problem. You know, obviously this, this weevil has uh, the capacity to, to uh, spread very fussy. This there we go. So we have these things in the lab called a flight mill. Basically, these are merry-go-rounds that we hook the weevils up to, and each time they go in a circle, they're flowing three, three feet. And we have a computer that records the distance and the speed, whether these weevils fly during the day or night. So we can record um, a lot of data for these weevils, and we can look at questions like, do males fly further than females? How about young males versus old males? How about weevils that are fed that are not fed? So we can take all those data and do some statistical analyses on it. And what I want to impress upon you when I show you the data is that these weevils 
are extremely good flyers in the lab. We have estimates that, you know, on average, they could fly maybe up to 28 miles in a 24 hour period. And some of these weevils will fly constantly for about four to five hours on the, on the flight mill and lose about 20% of their body weight. So you can see here's the average distance flown for females. It's about 25 miles or so. But we've had some extreme flyers that have managed to do 62, 75. We even had one female that could fly about 93 miles in a one 24 hour period. And she was still alive at the end of that. So whether or not these weevils decide to undertake these big flights in nature, we really don't know. But in the lab, they're quite capable of it. We haven't seen rapid spread of this weevil out of San Diego County. It's only made it as far as us. It's um, up around San Marcos, I think it is now. So one of the reasons we think the weevil's not spreading quickly in San Diego County is that there are just so many palm trees for it to feed on and it really hasn't had to push its way through any areas where there are a lack of hosts for it to feed on. And this may be one reason why it's not spreading that quickly through Southern California at this stage. So some of the work we've been doing on South American palm weevil is here in the Sweetwater Reserve. This is in Bonita, it's a riparian area. And this view, aerial view shows the reserve that, that we are working in here. And there are a lot of naturalized Canary Island date palms in here, and they are very um, heavily infested with South American palm weevil. Here's a close up from Google Earth. You can see the Canary Island date palms. Uh, they've basically formed an overstory over the tops of the willow trees here. And here's a dead Canary Island date palm that's been killed by the South American palm weevil. So in that reserve, we hang these bucket traps. And these traps are very important for monitoring the presence or absence of the weevil. And we're also um, teaching the date growers out in the Coachella Valley on how best to use these traps, not only for monitoring, but should the weevil establish in the date growing areas of Coachella Valley, they're gonna be a very important tool for reducing populations of weevils. So this is a bucket trap and it consists of uh, aggregation pheromone that's commercially available that attracts the weevils. We hang this from the lid of the bucket. And in the bucket, you need fermenting bait. And we use dates mixed with water and baker's yeast. And the, the volatiles that come off of this um, baker's yeast, basically it's a, it's, a, it's a container of date beer, probably something like the Egyptian pharaohs drank about 3000 years ago. It's quite a, quite a yeasty smell that comes out of these uh, containers. So the yeasty smell of the fermenting dates combined with the uh, pheromone makes it highly attractive to the weevils. They fly to the bucket, they walk up the burlap, drop in the hole, and in the bottom of the bucket, we have this antifreeze, which drowns the weevils and preserves them. So on this side, you see a graph with some bars on it. The green bars show the number of weevils that we catch in those traps each month. And you can see here out in April of 2018, we caught over 300 weevils in those 10 bucket traps. It was over 30 weevils per bucket. And the other thing that's instructive about this graph is that you see there are periods of activity that go up and down, up and down, up and down. So it looks like the weevil has times of the year where it's more active. It seems to be during late spring through early to mid summer. The interestingly though, even over winter, we're still catching weevils. So it never gets quite cold or wet enough here in Southern California to stop them flying to the trap. So they're active all year round. And the orange line here tells us the sex ratio. And in the buckets, we always catch about two females to one male. And this is because the aggregation pheromone is a male produced pheromone. So it seems to be more attractive to the females. And on average, we catch about 66% females. And this is quite consistent through through the course of this study. So if we leave the reserve and we go outside of the reserve area and we have a look at what's happening to the palm trees around the Sweetwater Reserve, we've been monitoring palm health for about four years now, over four years now. And we have about 519 Canary Island date palms that we tagged in a north, south, west and east uh, directions around the Sweetwater Reserve. Every six months we drive around, check the health of those trees you can see when we started in August of 2016, our 519 palms were all healthy looking. When we did the last survey in August of uh, 2020, almost 47% of those palm trees in urban areas have now been killed by the South American palm weevil. So it's, it's a very aggressive pest and it's causing a lot of damage in areas where populations have established. So in addition to being a strong flyer, you know, one other way this weevil could be moved inadvertently is through the 
distribution of infested palm trees that are taken out of southern San Diego County and then moved into new areas such as LA or maybe up to the San Luis Obispo. And amazingly, there's no quarantine in San Diego County to stop the movement of palm trees out of areas that are infested with South American palm weevil. So this is something you need to keep an eye on, not only in the urban areas, but for the PCAs that are out in the desert. Definitely want to keep an eye on palm trees in urban areas. And if you're responsible for doing any work in the date gardens out there, this is something you've really got to keep an eye out for. It could be quite damaging should it establish out in those date production areas. So we are looking at biological control as a possible way of controlling this pest. Um, there's good research out of Brazil that suggests that this parasitic fly can kill about 50% of those weevils each year. Uh, parasitism ranges from about 30 to 7 70 percent or so and the larvae get into these pupil cocoons and kill the pupa weevil pupa so if each weevil cocoon on average is, produces about 18 flies which is really pretty good that's a nice nice return we actually have money to go to south america to do that we got that funding from the usda to go down and begin some preliminary work but then the COVID start stuff hit and brazil became a real hot spot for the virus and things just haven't been going very well. So we've had to suspend that program. We've been given a, another year to see whether or not we can get down into Brazil to look for this fly and just do some basic studies on its biology. We don't even know how, how to breed them. So hopefully we could breed them in a box. And if we could breed them in a box and we could bring them back to quarantine here at, at Riverside and uh, do some experiments to see how, how safe they would be for use in a biocontrol program against South American palm weevil. Okay. So let's have a look at our response to newly established pests. Oh, looks like I might have a slide out of order. Okay, if we come across that video, we'll play it later. So um, what I want to describe to you is what has happened to our um, citrus industry with response to Asian citrus psyllid and what we ended up doing about this. Now, Asian citrus psyllid is a non-native insect that's established in California. It, obviously, it has a as its name suggests, it really likes feeding on citrus and it'll use curry plants, which are closely related to citrus as a host plant too. But it's not so much the fact that this psyllid, which is a sap sucking hemipterum pest, you know, drinks the juice out of these citrus trees. But the reason that the citrus trees end up dying after psyllid populations develop and feed on them is because that the psyllid spreads a bacterium which causes Huang Long Bing. And this disease is a death sentence for citrus trees. You can see these trees here in Pakistan that have died from Huang Long Bing. And as they get passed through the, the dying process, I guess, the leaves become mottled like this. These are photos that I took in Florida where they have a lot of Huang Long Bing and a lot of HLB. Leaves drop off the trees, a fruit um, drop prematurely and the tree just goes into gradual decline as the bacterium is uh, multiplying in the phloem. But the psyllid, these winged adults that can fly, are primarily responsible for moving the bacterium from citrus tree to citrus tree. So this is a timeline of the major events that happened with the ACP and the HLB invasion into California. We first found Asian citrus psyllid in San Diego in 2008. Then it became obvious that we were not going to be able to control that pest through spray programs in the urban environment and the psyllid was spreading rapidly. It was moving outside of the containment boundaries. So at that stage, the Citrus Research Board funded a foreign exploration program and we went to Pakistan to look for natural enemies of Asian citrus psyllid. Pakistan is part of the native range of Asian citrus psyllid, so we expected to find natural enemies there. And it also has about a 70% climate match with the Central Valley, which is a major citrus production growing area in California. About 85% or so of California citrus comes from the Central Valley. So we went to Pakistan in September of 2010. We made multiple trips in 2011. One of these was about a couple of months. Went back in 2012 looking for natural enemies and again in April of 2013 looking for natural enemies. And we were successful. Christina, my wife and I, we went on all these trips and we had a lot of success looking for parasitoids attacking the nymphs of Asian citrus psyllid. One of those important natural enemies was Tamarixia radiata and it, we were able to fast track that and we got that insect released and it established quickly in California in December of 2011. 
Now while we were doing this work, sprays were continuing, but you can see that there was a three year lag before we were able to do anything with biological control against Asian citrus psyllid. And while the spray program was going on, it was estimated that about 6% of the properties that were infested in Southern California, especially Los Angeles County, were treated. And that came at a cost of about $5 million. And by October 2012, the urban spray program was largely ended in Southern California. Now, during that time, the disease was found in LA County in urban citrus in 2012, showed up in Orange County in 2015, and then in 2017, it was found in Riverside County, and it subsequently spread into San Bernardino County as well. So while all this was happening, with respect to the psyllid spreading and the disease spreading throughout Southern California, we were still having to rear up, do a lot of the releases establishment, monitor the spread and the impact of Tamarixia radiata against Asian citrus psyllid. So the biological control program, even though it had started, was still taking a long time to gear up. And we had to um, get the CDFA to help us with the mass rearing program because re rearing up a few hundred or a few thousand parasites just wasn't cutting it. You know, we needed to be mass rearing and releasing millions of these parasites to combat Asian citrus psyllid in urban environments. And then by 2014, after four years after the biocontrol program started, we got permission to release a second parasitoid, Diaphora insertus, and unfortunately this parasitoid does not appear to have established in Southern California. So by 2018, I'd obviously need to update this, over 10 million Tamarixia had been released, largely reared by the California Department of Food and Ag, and over 490,000 Diaphora insertus had been released. Uh, we were not making consistent recoveries of that second parasitoid, so that release program ended. But you can see, it took about 10 years to go from first detection to finally rearing and releasing millions of these parasitoids, so a long, long lag period after initial dis discovery. Three-year delay in getting the biocontrol program started and the first parasitoids introduced. And during that time, a lot of spraying was going on in an attempt to contain, and there was some pipe dream of actually trying to eradicate Asian citrus psyllid from urban citrus. That, frankly, was never going to happen. So should California be better prepared for the invasion of Asian citrus psyllid? Absolutely, it should have been. The insect and the disease were known to be in Florida, Texas, and Mexico, and it just seemed inevitable that California was going to get Asian citrus psyllid and Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus, the causative agent of HLB. But, you know, we took the business as usual approach. ACP invaded, spread, and then we react to that invasion. We wait, we watch, we assess, we go to lots of meetings, we discuss the pros and cons of what's going to happen. And that process takes about two to three years to work our way through before the biocontrol program starts. And during that time, the psylla builds up to large numbers, spreads, the pathogen shows up and it's getting spread as well. We should have learned this lesson from what had happened to Florida especially, and then what we'd seen in Texas. The insect and the disease have had a devastating impact on their citrus industries. So now what we're proposing is a different way of dealing with predictable threats. Instead of sitting and waiting for that bad bug to arrive in California, if you know it's already established in the United States, why not be proactive and begin screening the natural enemies now for a potential biological control program so you have them ready in advance of the anticipated arrival of that pest in California? So proactive biological control, the concept is really simple. You basically have your natural enemies locked and loaded. You've done the screening, you have the approvals to release from the USDA, the permits are in hand, and when the invasion occurs, pretty much the next day you could go out and begin the biological control program if it appears that you can't contain and eradicate that new invasive pest. So basically you want to control the situation by taking action ahead of the time rather than responding after the issue has happened. Go out and identify and collect natural enemies. For Asian citrus psyllid, those natural enemies were well known and it was just a matter of finding the right place in the world to go and collect them, and that was Pakistan for us because of a good climate match. You do all this work in the quarantine facility. It's going to be expensive, and it's going to take several years to complete, 
You have to do the safety testing to make sure that the natural enemies will not cause any problems should they be released in California. After you've done those studies, which may take a couple of years to uh, complete, you then prepare an environment assessment review for the USDA APHIS and the North American Plant Protection Organization to review. Then hopefully you've found a good natural enemy. The data shows that it poses no risk to non-target species and a finding of non-significance is issued and that's known as a FONSI, not the guy from Happy Days. And what you'd want to do is maintain a library of these release permits, renew them as necessary. So as these pests are building on the horizon, you have your permits sitting in a filing cabinet, maybe with the CDFA, the pest invades, establishes, you pull out your permit, you go to the USDA, say, hey, we're cleared to release these natural enemies, and they should say, sure, fine, get your colonies going and begin the releases of those natural enemies. So this would begin. After you've screened your natural enemies, you have a detection of an established non-eradicable pest population, you begin the biocontrol program with those natural enemies. And, uh, you know, if we've done that with Asian citrus psyllid, we may have been able to knock those pest populations back quite a bit more quickly than what we did as it spread through those urban environments. So yeah, the idea would be to save years of time, slow pest spread and re reduce adverse economic and environmental impacts that come from the use of a lot of insecticide sprays. So how would you actually do this? So we've been screening uh, the horizon looking for some of these pests. I gave you an example of Asian citrus psyllid. That's the one we've worked on. Uh, brown marmorated stink bug came into Pennsylvania in 1998, established here in California in 2005. We reactively developed a biocontrol program for that. And it appears that we have probably got ahead of that curve as those populations of brown marmorade stink bug are now starting to uh, build up in Northern California and will probably present quite a threat to the nut industry up there. South American palm weevil, we sort of missed the boat on that, but we're trying to catch ground on that one now. So we've looked overseas as well. We've identified avocado pests that could come into California. We've already developed proactive IPM programs for Stenoma catanifer. This is a, the avocado seed moth. It's not established in California yet, but we have the uh, sex pheromone for this pest and we also have natural enemies uh, listed. So we know what to do should this pest show up in California's avocado orchards. And we're doing a similar project now for the avocado seed weevil, Helipus lowry. So we can um, borrow some results from other biological control programs. So we have um, sort of worked our way into the USDA's brown marmorated stink bug project. And we've now jumped onto their lanternfly program and we're gonna be talking about that uh, a little bit later. And um, the USDA APHIS has this really interesting um, newsletter they send out every week or so, it's called Pest Lens. And it's basically somebody at APHIS screening the literature to look for new um, pest arrivals in different areas of the world or discoveries of new pest insects that have been described and they list these and I scan them every week to see if anything is of interest and potential importance for California. And the other way that California could do this is surveillance interception. So for example, USDA uh, CDFA puts out a lot of traps to monitor for potential invasive pests coming into California and if we are trapping live insects say of false codling moth for example, that suggests that there is a conduit that's allowing live insects to reach California and they could possibly establish here. So if unwanted bugs like um, these moth species, for example, such as false codling moth have been intercepted in California's live adults, that should send up a red flag. We should consider being proactively, uh, be in a situation to proactively mitigate that potential invasion. And then there's always the wild cards. You know, there's just some things you don't know about which could come to California. And one good example of that is the avocado thrips, which was an unknown species until it established here in California. And we eventually tracked that down as coming from quite a pecoranus in Mexico. So you're always gonna have these wild cards that could just come out of left field and hit you. And you just had no way of knowing that those things were on the horizon and coming here. So have we attempted this before? Yes, proactive biocontrol, we've tried this before. And our first project was on the um, avocado seed moth, Stenoma catanifer. We identified the parasites that attack the larvae of those uh, moths, and it's the larvae that feed inside the fruit on the seed that do all the economic damage. 
and we identified the sex pheromone for that moth so we can establish a trapping program for it. And in the process of doing this work in Guatemala on the avocado seed moth, we also discovered other species of moths that attack avocados that were undescribed species and were unknown until we completed this work. One of these is Hystera perceivora, known as the avocado destroyer, which seems to be quite a prominent pest in parts of Guatemala. And that could potentially have been a wild card for us, but we have identified that one now, and we also know the natural enemies of that moth. New Zealand's been very aggressive in this approach. They have been alarmed about the prospect of brown marmorated stink bug establishing in New Zealand. It's not there yet, but they've already screened this little egg parasitoid and they have it cleared for approval. So should brown marmorated stink bug establish in New Zealand, pretty much the next day they can go out and release Trisulcus japonicus for biological control of brown marmorated stink bug in New Zealand. And we wanna be prepared in the same way for California. Okay, so what did we learn from this? Well, if you look at the Asian citrus psyllid program that we ran, we have spent a lot of time over multiple sites, years, several years across several sites in Southern California. The data that we have collected summarized here in one graph clearly demonstrated that the parasite that we have released has contributed to at least a 70% decline in the densities of Asian citrus psyllid in California. This graph shows a lot of ACP adults on citrus trees shown here in blue. Parasite was released and established. And as we see the parasitism rates here peak and go down through time, Asian citrus psyllid populations decrease to almost undetectable levels. In fact, you know, I haven't seen Asian citrus psyllid on my citrus in Riverside for the last four years at least. And I've even planted citrus varieties that the psyllid loves and a lot of curry plants as well too. I wanted a, basically an insectary in my backyard where I could keep my Pakistani parasitoids ticking over, but they did such a good job. I've lost the psyllid populations and they haven't come back. So what would be the benefits of this project? Well, if we extrapolate what we have seen from our studies that we've done at Riverside, and we're just wrapping up an even bigger study now with David Morgan with the CDFA, over four years across 20 something sites that spread from LA on the coast all the way to the desert areas in the Coachella Valley where citrus is growing, it looks like psyllid numbers have declined by more than 90%. And we've just started, um, we're wrapping up those analyses now. And the data strongly suggests that natural enemies, generalist predators, and just as importantly, that parasitoid Tamarixia radiata from Pakistan, have been instrumental in driving psyllid numbers down to low levels. So with all this COVID stuff that's going on, you've heard about this term like crushing the curve. Well, we really crushed the population curve of Asian citrus psyllid with the biological control program in citrus in Southern California. The data are very strong and support that statement. So the goal of the biocontrol program against Asian citrus psyllid was basically to bottle up and reduce ACP populations in urban areas to reduce the risk of the psyllid and the bacterium escaping urban citrus and getting into these commercial production areas. And even though the biocontrol program started about three years or so after the initial detection of ACP in Southern California, it looks like the program has been successful in doing that. So basically ACP and the disease have been almost completely confined to urban citrus areas, uh, urban citrus for more than 10 years. And this is the longest record that we know of so far. Other areas like Florida that received the insect and the disease were unable to keep it out of their production areas for such a long time. And unfortunately, as of August 2020, the first hot psyllid was found in a woodcrest orchard in, in Riverside. And by hot, I mean it was an adult ACP that tested positive for the bacterium. So we've gone, you know, quite a long time, 12 years or more, of no detections of hot psyllids in commercial citrus and I think the biocontrol program has contributed significantly to that by substantially lowering pest populations in urban citrus which reduced migration into commercial production areas. So did the biocontrol program contribute to this uh, population suppression? I think so and if we had been proactive with uh, the Asian biocontrol Asian citrus psyllid biocontrol program, if we had those natural enemies screened and approved for release prior to ACP establishing California, 
maybe we could have amplified greatly the impact of those natural enemies on those small Asian citrusillid populations. We'll never know the answer to that, but I think the data suggests that if we'd been uh, proactive, better prepared, and had those natural enemies ready to go earlier, we probably could have prolonged this time period before hot psyllids were first found in commercial citrus orchards. So moving forward, California is going into this proactive biocontrol program. We, uh, CDFA has funded several proactive, project, proactive projects in California, spotted lanternfly, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Tuta absoluta is an invasive uh, moth that's really devastating to vegetables that are grown in the field and in greenhouses. And we have another grant to work on the avocado seed weevils. We now have the aggregation pheromone for that pest. So we are eager to get back now to Mexico after the COVID stuff uh, winds down a bit and start testing that pheromone in avocado orchards in Mexico. To see how effective it is for trapping weevils, attracting weevils. So let's talk about this pest. Um, we're working on this right now. This is spotted lanternfly. It's a beautiful insect, quite large, native to India, China, and Vietnam, first found in Pennsylvania in 2014, showed up in New York and Delaware in 2017, and then spread out to New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia by 2018, spreading very rapidly along the east coast of the USA. And one reason for that is that these females don't seem to be particularly fussy about where they lay their eggs. They'll even lay them on the sides of train carriages and possibly trains moving up and down the eastern seaboard, maybe even coming west to California, uh, moving the egg masses of this pest into new areas. And it's quite prolific. It feeds on a lot of different plants and uh, can develop. Nymphs can develop on a lot of different plants as well. This insect has not no live spotted lanternfly have been found in California yet, but dead adults have been found in aircraft arriving in Southern California, and those aircraft originated from the East Coast of the United States. So why we are concerned about it in California is that it is extremely prolific. It feeds on a lot of different plants, and here you can see it feeding on grapevines in Pennsylvania. And at the last Entomological Society of America meeting, I went to the spotted lanternfly workshops, and these vineyards, which had received these heavy infestations of spotted lanternfly for two years in a row, they died the following winter, uh, spring. And one of the reasons for that was postulated is that the amount of sap that these insects are sucking out and excreting out of these grapevines reduced the sugar loads in, in the grapes, which meant they didn't have the right or the high enough concentrations of sugars to protect themselves from the really cold winters, kind of like an antifreeze that would protect the radiator of your car, and the vines succumbed to uh, cold damage and they eventually died. The acreage is small. You know, a lot of these uh, vineyards in the, on the East Coast are maybe 10 acres at the most, but two or so of these vineyards were completely killed off indirectly, probably through spotted lanternfly feeding. The adults are quite easy to kill with um, contact insecticides like pyrethroids, but the invasion pressure coming from the surrounding forests, which uh, are around these vineyards, just results in lots and lots of these spotted lanternflies continually flying into these vineyards, even though they spray a lot to keep them out. So is biological control an option for this pest? Yes, it could be a good target. There is an egg parasitoid that is in quarantine in Delaware. The USDA has this. We now have colonies of that egg parasitoid in Riverside in our quarantine facility here on the UC Riverside campus. And we are now t doing the safety tests to screen those natural enemies or that egg parasitoid ahead of the anticipated arrival of spotted lanternfly in California. We're most worried about this pest establishing up in Northern California where it could present not only a threat to the wine and table grape industry, but it's also known to feed on uh, nut crops. And in South Korea, for example, where spotted lanternfly is also invasive, it appears to be a significant pest of walnuts that are grown in South Korea. So it's likely to attack pistachios, almonds, walnuts in California as, as well. Okay, so some conclusions. Our invasive pest issues are not diminishing here in Southern California. We've we have a lot of things on the horizon. And one big one that we're dealing with right now is the South American palm weevil. We may be able to go into South America and find a parasitic fly that could attack the pupae and larvae of those weevils and see some of the dead Canary Island date palms here at the Glen Abbey Cemetery in Bonita. 
Our business as usual approach, I think, needs disrupting. Often our biocontrol programs and our pest management programs are reactive. We don't do anything until the pest has arrived, it's established, it's spread, and it's causing economic damage. We can identify some of these invasive pests that are sitting out there on the horizon before they get to California. We could proactively develop management programs and be uh, have them ready for the anticipated arrival of those pests in California before they get here. So I think proactive biocontrol, it's basically just a new spin on an old idea. You know, classical biological control, the importation of natural enemies to suppress pest populations in California, that whole science was developed here. In California, it has always been a reactive pest management approach. What we're suggesting is just let's try and get ahead of it for California agriculture. Let's identify these pests and get some of these natural enemies screened and approved for release prior to the arrival of those pests. Okay, so let's watch a video. I changed the video, um, Peter, because you'd seen the other one. So we're going to watch this one instead. It's on spotted lanternfly. So it's been a long drive to get here, nine hours, 600 miles, and we're looking for native lanternflies here in the Chiricahua Mountains. <music> On the east coast of the United States, there is an invasion that is currently underway. And this is by the spotted lanternfly, which is native to China. Its populations have grown very quickly, it's spreading rapidly, and it appears to be an agricultural pest. One of the host plants it really likes feeding on are grapes. This is a highly important specialty crop for California. We're very worried about the spotted lanternfly arriving in California inadvertently becoming a potential invasive insect pest that could do a lot of economic damage. So we are planning a biological control program in advance of the anticipated arrival of spotted lanternfly into California. If we are to use natural enemies to suppress populations of spotted lanternfly to lower levels, we need to understand whether those parasites that we bring from China will have an adverse and unwanted effect on the native insect fauna here in the southwestern parts of the United States. The first objective is to capture adult lanternflies at night using a black light. It's probably not really fair to say that they're being attracted by the bugs so much as it's just screwing up their navigation system. Normally we'll navigate using the moon because that's about the only thing that's visible in the dark that you can steer by to go in a straight line. But if you create an artificial moon, like a UV bulb like this, then any beetle that's flying past it is going to get confused between that and an actual moon. And what that winds up doing is it makes them basically crash into wherever you put the light. So far the trip has been extremely successful. We have captured adult lanternflies at night using the black lights. So he's right here. Sitting on that damp piece of paper. He's still moving, so he's still alive. So we're hoping that he'll go off of that paper start feeding on this bark, in the cracks of the bark. And to help with that, Francesca's peeled away a little bit of bark so it's not so thick. So you're gonna have easy access to the food conducting tubes in the tree trunk. The second objective is to cage those lanternflies onto possible native host plants. These could either be junipers or oaks. So the way they work is that we open them up and we fit them over a branch like this, seal up the end with the drawstring and we put our insects in here and the idea is that they'll feed on this plant and they'll live and we can study their biology. A major breakthrough for us was with the insecticide fogging.
And as you can see in this container, who would have thought that much insect life were living on these trees behind me? We have the first nymphs for these lanternflies. These have not been seen before. And because they fell out of the trees that we were fogging with insecticide, we feel very confident that those immature stages are probably feeding on the juniper trees that we were fogging. And this is the first record we've got for the potential host plant species that some of these lanternflies may be feeding on. So that's been a real breakthrough for us. The University of California Riverside, especially the entomology department, is a world leader in biological control programs. So the Spotted Lanternfly project that we're running now is really building on the successes of a lot of other biological control programs that have been launched out of UC Riverside. Our quarantine facility, it's world class. It's one of the largest in the world. If we didn't have that facility at UCR, there is no way we could do this work for California. And when you consider the economic benefits that come from biological control programs, the millions of dollars that natural enemies can save growers through reduced crop losses and through reduced pesticide use, that really plows back into the economy of California. So there are benefits that affect everybody in California. If you eat fruits and vegetables, nuts, you have benefited from biological control in California through programs that have reduced pesticide use on those crops. All right, that's it. Is anybody still there? <laughs> or have you all gone home? <laughs> we do have some questions that came right. in. Let me go back to the beginning. So um, back to palm weevil, somebody had a question about the, the structure on the rostrum. Yeah. Um, wondering what the purpose of that was. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if that's really been studied. Why do those males have those bristles? Um, it's possible they could use them for um, sexual displays to proof of the female that hey i'm a big macho guy with a big beard so maybe you want to mate with me um it's also possible they could have some sort of sensory function to do with uh sniffing out that pheromone um that seems unlikely because the antennae are probably more likely to do that so it probably comes down to a, a mating thing where they could use them in displays i think Okay, uh, the next one, do the weevils attack only date palms or do they go to other palm species? Yeah, so in California, we definitely know that they do a lot of damage to the Canary Island date palms, and those are the palm trees that are typically pruned up to the top to kind of look like pineapples. We have a record of uh, about three uh, Guadalupe palms being killed by a South American palm weevil at Balboa Park. Um, in areas where uh, the weevil is native, such as parts of Mexico and Central America, it is known to attack date palms, the edible date palm, Phoenix dactylifera. And there are also records of it attacking the Mexican fan palms, Washingtonia robusta, which suggests that our native California date um, fan palm, Washingtonia uh, filifera, could be vulnerable to attack by South American palm weevil as well. But at this time, we only have confirmed kills of two palm species in California, the Canary Island date palms and Guadalupe palms. Okay, there was a question in the chat. Um, uh, I think it's referring to the palm weevil. Um, when you mentioned it was large and they wanted to know what did that mean if it was one inch? Yeah, so um, I just threw that out there to give you an idea of just how big this insect is in comparison to a lot of other weevils that are in California. So if you see a large black bug with a long nose flying around a palm tree in your backyard, there's a good chance that could be South American palm weevil and you should let us uh, know. Uh, smaller insects, you know, uh, are more difficult to see visually, but South American palm weevil, you can see it flying during the day and you can hear it flying during the day and you can see them on the sides of palm trees, on the fronds. Sometimes we've even I've even been at the gas station <laughs> in San Diego gassing up the university car to come back. And I guess I must have had pheromone on me and they were buzzing from, I don't know where they were coming from, but they were hitting me, landing on the, the Bowser next to me while I was gassing up the car. So yeah, they're strong flyers, they're big. So if you see a big black weevil flying around and it's near a palm tree, it could be South American palm weevil. 
Uh, okay. Uh, uh, what size is the red ring nematode? Are they hitchhikers on top of or in the actual mouth parts of the weevils? Yes, yeah, so the nematodes are very small. You'd need a microscope to see them, and the weevils can move them in a couple of ways. Some studies suggest that the nematodes can hang on to the outside of the weevil's body, and when the weevil flies from palm tree to palm tree, the nematodes drop off. And other studies have shown that they could even be um, uh, released through the mouth parts as the weevil feeds, meaning that they're inside the weevil body. And evidence also suggests that should weevils uh, defecate inside palm trees, that they could uh, be in the weevil feces, which again suggests that the nematodes can be inside the weevil's body. So I guess they can move two ways, either inside the weevil or hanging on to the outside of the weevil's body. But regardless of whether they're inside or outside, the nematode needs the weevil to move it from palm tree to palm tree because the nematode can't do that job on its own. But the Weevils obviously have wings and they're strong flies and they can move the nematodes around. Okay, um, how many weevils attack a single palm tree? Yeah, so uh, we don't know the answer to that, but studies suggest that as few as, possibly as few as about 30 larvae in the top of a palm tree are sufficient to kill that palm tree. When we have cut down palm trees in San Diego County, we have found hundreds of weevils in those palm trees feeding. So the Canary Island date palm has a very large crown and the crown size is related to trunk diameter. And palm trees, when they start growing, the trunk is the same diameter from the ground up. You know, it doesn't taper. So the larger that meristematic tissue or the palm heart at the top of the tree, at uh, the top of the trunk, the more food there is for the weevils to feed on, which will allow more and more weevils to feed in the top of that palm tree. And you compare that to say a skinny trunked uh, Washingtonia robusta, there's not going to be as much meat or palm heart at the top of that trunk. So the numbers of weevils that can feed in there and kill that palm tree will be fewer. Okay, the next one. Um, why isn't there a quarantine on moving palms from infected areas? That's a great question and I don't know. <laughs> It's been discussed a lot of times and um, nobody at the CDFA or within the County of San Diego has done anything about putting quarantines on those palms. And it's a, it's a mystery to me. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, has Washingtonia Californica been impacted by the South American palm weevil? No, we have no um, evidence of any species of Washingtonia, whether it be the native California fan palm or the Mexican fan palm being attacked by the South American palm weevil. However, the very first record of South American palm weevil was at the very tip of the Baja Peninsula down near Cabo San Lucas, and that was back in 2000. And it was attacking Mexican fan palms down there. So sometime between 2000 and 2010, that weevil moved its way up the Baja Peninsula and established on Canary Island date palms in Tijuana. Given the 10 year lag, from its first discovery at the tip of the Baja in 2000 to us finding it in 2010 in Tijuana, that suggests to me that it, there's a possibility that South American palm weevil just naturally spread up the Baja Peninsula by flying from, you know, township to township and just feeding on the palm trees that are growing in those areas. And humans, I think, have been instrumental in allowing a tropical palm weevil to establish in desert areas. We have planted all sorts of palm trees in areas where normally there would be no palms and there certainly would be no water to keep them alive. And we've basically provided stepping stones for this weevil to escape the tropical jungles and basically hopscotch all its way up, way up here into the semi-desert areas of Southern California. Okay, uh, the next one, why would there be so many males in the traps? Are they just attracted to the bait? Yes, yeah, so, um, the sex ratio in those bucket traps of the palm weevils is heavily biased towards females. So typically what we are seeing is that for every male that you capture in the bucket trap, you get about two females. And the sex ratio is about 66% female. And we think the reason for that is that the aggregation pheromone that is released by the palm weevils is released by the males. And the males probably don't find the pheromone of another male that attractive 
but females find the aggregation pheromone released by males to be quite attractive and that's why we end up with more females in the bucket traps than males. Okay, uh, has the spotted lantern shown interest in avocado? Yeah, so um, we have no evidence at this stage that spotted lanternfly will feed on avocados. However, I suspect that it would probably be a reasonably good host for that um, insect should it establish in Southern California. Some of the data that's coming out of the Northeastern United States now is suggesting that Southern California year round may be too warm to support perennial populations of spotted lanternfly. And some of that climate modeling work suggests that the uh, more northern areas, possibly from San Luis Obispo northwards, and once you get away from the coast into the interior areas where, where it could tend to be a little more cooler, uh, it could be, the climate there could be sufficient to support spotted lanternfly year round. However, that's just computer modeling at this stage and we really don't know what the ecological amplitude of that pest is. It may have tolerance for heat that's greater than what we expect it to. We just don't know at this stage. Okay, this next one I think is clarification on that first video that you showed. Um, if that was the weevil flying in circles on the machine and you said it was going 90 miles an hour. No, no, not my 90 miles an hour, no. It could fly 90 miles in a 24 hour period. Yeah, so we would hook them up to that flight mill and just leave them for a 24 hour period. And then we would, then the computer would record how often they flew around in a circle. And because we know the diameter of that circle, we can figure out how far it was flying. So the largest, the biggest flying insects went up to about 90 something miles. And on average, they're flying around 20 to 30 miles in a 24 hour period, which is still very impressive. They are big beetles, they're very strong flyers. When you're in their habitat, like at that Sweetwater Reserve, and you're changing the pheromone trap, you can hear them flying. You hear them buzzing around. And they're big enough that, you know, you can hear them crashing through the, <laughs> crashing through the foliage to reach those bucket traps. You know, they just, like, bust their way through stuff to get to the bucket trap. And they're very impressive. Okay, uh, the next one, has the Asian citrus psyllid parasitoid been released in other states? And if so, has it reduced numbers there too? Yeah, so Tamarixia radiata has been released in Florida. Florida sourced its populations from Southeast Asia where it's hot and humid, wet, a lot of rain. And they had a program that was run differently to ours. And even though Tamarixia established in Florida, it does not appear to have been as um, impactful or as successful against Asian citrus psyllid as Tamarixia radiata in California has been. Uh, one potential reason that we suspect that that could be the case, but we have no uh, experimental evidence for this, is that when the Floridians did their biocontrol program, you know, they went into places like Vietnam, collected the parasite, brought it back to Florida, and they just continuously bred the parasitoids in a couple of cages. And we think they may have lost a lot of genetic diversity and resulted in an inbred population that was really well adapted to lab conditions. And then they were releasing like substandard parasitoids into the environment. And those parasitoids established and they've done a little bit of uh, damage to the populations, but probably not as much as what Florida was hoping for. So in California, we did something different and Richard Stouthammer at UCR is a geneticist and he's got an interest in how best to preserve the genetic diversity of um, natural enemies. So when Christina and I went to Pakistan and we brought back these parasitoids, he told us before we went, you know, when you find stuff, keep it separated. Keep it separated by collection date and um, collection location. So when we came back to Riverside after doing multiple visits to Pakistan, we basically had about 17 colonies going in uh, the quarantine facility. And each colony represented a different collection location and a different collection time. And each one of those cages was just bred back in on itself. And each cage became highly inbred. And through inbreeding, the genetics theory suggests everybody will end up homozygous. And once you're homozygous, you can't lose any more genetic diversity. You can't adapt to the quarantine conditions. 
So assuming that's true, we had 17 homozygous populations of parasitoids from Pakistan. What we did then was we took those 17 different inbred lines and then put them in one cage so they could mate randomly with each other. And the idea was that through this random mating, you would restore a lot of the genetic variation that had been captured. So each cage represented a snapshot of genetic variation. And then through the inbreeding, that genetic variation became fixed. Some genetic variation was lost because the parasitoids were inbred. But when we allowed them to mix in the big mating cage, where they it was basically a mating free-for-all. You could mate with, say, cage one could mate with somebody from cage 13, who could mate with somebody from cage eight, and all their genetic material was getting all mixed up again. Then we put those uh, hybrids into the field with the idea that natural selection would act on those genetic variants and the environment would select strains of Tamarixia radiata that were best adapted to, say, the riverside area, say, out in the desert area where... Um, where releases were made, maybe in the Los Angeles area where it's a bit cooler because it's closer to the coast. And that may have been a contributing factor as to why Tamarixia did really well here. You know, the first releases we did were in December, middle of winter. We found a grapefruit tree in LA. It had a lot of psyllids on it. We released the parasites. We came back two weeks later and we just couldn't believe it. They had established, they had parasitized. We did, we did the DNA analyses and those parasites had the Pakistani DNA fingerprint. So they were our parasites that we put out there. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, I was giving a talk like this, I think it was to a Kapka chapter at a casino way out in Indio. And they had citrus trees around the casino. We'd made no releases out there at all. And I found parasitized ACP on those citrus. And incredibly, it was the Pakistani parasites. <laughs> so somehow that, parasitoid has been really good at getting around and it seemed to be doing quite well out in India, which is a kind of a hot, nasty place over summer and um, parasite was there. So that may have been a contributing factor, but the data that we have undeniably indicates that psyllid numbers in urban citrus in Southern California have gone down a lot after the biocontrol program established, uh, was, was established. One study we did from LA suggests about a 70% reduction. We've just finished up that big four-year study with the CDFA, which suggests that psyllid numbers may have de declined in some areas by as much as 90%, which I think is amazing. And just a quick follow-up with that one. Um, and what is the result on reducing the HLB in those um, citrus? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And, um, Overall, rates of HLB in urban citrus are still, I, I would turn them as being relatively low, especially when you compare to what you'd see in Florida. But as a lot of critics of this program put out, point out, is that you know one psyllid is all it takes to spread the bacterium around, and, and that's true. But you can also make a similar criticism of the use of insecticides. They never kill every psyllid. And you certainly can't get into everybody's backyard to apply pesticides three or four times a year to kill Asian citrus psyllids, but the biocontrol agents are there working all the time. And I think the data supports not only declined a decreased psyllid populations, but we have not seen a wildfire spread of HLB throughout um, the citrus production areas of, of California. And I think one reason for that is that uh, the natural enemies reduced psyllid numbers to a level where the threat that they were posing to agricultural citrus was reduced enough that it's delayed the um, spread of the disease out of urban areas into, into agricultural production zones. Okay, uh, what strategies do you recommend to homeowners um, for ACP and backyard citrus, if there's others? Yeah, so that's a great question, and there's a whole other set of studies that we have done and which I didn't talk about here but if you saw my ant talk a couple of months ago you would know that controlling ants in your backyard is probably the best thing that you can do to control Asian citrus psyllid on your citrus. Once the ants are removed natural enemies decimate Asian citrus psyllid. They also decimate um, brown soft scale. They decimate citrus mealybug. They decimate um, citrus aphids. 
But when the ants are on the trees, they protect those sap-sucking pests from their natural enemies. And the reason they do that is that those sap suckers reward them with honeydew. And that's a sugary waste product that the ants love to drink and take back to the nest to feed the queen. But if you get rid of the ants, they're no longer protecting their livestock from natural enemies. And the natural enemies come in very quickly and really just do an amazing job on controlling those citrus pests. So all the old timers that used to work here at UCR and ran the biocontrol programs against these citrus pests, they found really effective natural enemies and even way back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they knew that Argentine ant was a problem. But now we've developed better baiting strategies and we have really effective insecticides that uh, you can use at ultra low concentrations to control Argentine ant. And once you get rid of the ants, then you can really reduce a lot of the pest load on your citrus trees. So if you're a homeowner, if you've got citrus, got a lot of ant activity on your citrus, uh, get out some baits and uh, start killing off those ants. Okay, uh, the next one. Have you tried any natural additives to the pheromone traps that may have a synergistic effect on the captures of weevils? Oh, right. That's an interesting question. Yes. Yeah, so in the traps, what I didn't tell you is we do have a synergist and it's called ethyl acetate. And that's a commercially available uh, chemical, which we hang on the lid of the bucket trap with the aggregation pheromone. And that increases trap captures. But perhaps the most important additive that you can put into your bucket, and it's strongly recommended, is that you need that fermenting bait. We use dates, water, and a packet of baker's yeast to get the fermentation process going. That works really well. I've also used pineapple chunks left in the syrup, and I put baker's yeast in there as well and get to get that fermenting quickly, and it, that also works well. You don't have to add baker's yeast to the uh, fruit bait. Just natural yeast will... Uh, fall into the, the container and will start the fermenting process, but it just takes a bit longer for that process to start. So we decided to kickstart it using baker's yeast. And then I was looking online, you can also buy these wine yeasts and lager yeasts. They're, they're different species of yeasts. I thought, oh, yeah, we should put those in the cups to see if maybe like a wine yeast, maybe it releases a more fruity type odor that the weevils find really attractive. So we tried together in trials baker's yeast, lager yeast, and these commercially available wine yeasts. And interestingly, the lager yeast and the wine yeast did not perform better than baker's yeast. Baker's yeast that you can just buy at the supermarket, where you used to be able to buy it before the COVID hit, and it's hard to find baker's yeast now. Serendipitously, that ended up being the best yeast species to use based on the work that we've done over a two year period in San Diego County. So the yeasts can help, but they're not essential. If you are going to add yeast, we recommend that you use Baker's yeast and you can get it at the supermarket or you used to be able to, not sure, it's, it's hard to find now. And then um, how often would you need to change the pheromone and additives for the tra and the traps? Yeah, that's a great question too. So um, we are on a monthly rotation. So I go down there every month, I swap out the pheromone and I swap out the baits. The baits are definitely done after a four week period. Everything is sort of uh, fermented itself out. The uh, pheromones may have another couple of weeks of activity left in them, but because I go down every month, I just swap out everything at once. Okay, is the current infestation of the palm weevil in San Diego County too far gone for significant control of spread? And are there any large entities currently doing control programs in San Diego? Yeah, so the weevil is now spread over a really large area. It basically stretches all the way from San Isidro, which is down near the border with Tijuana, all the way up to San Marcos. It's out as far uh, east as El Cajon. Um, I'm not saying it would be impossible to eradicate it over that big area, but it would really require a concerted effort. There are no agencies um, engaged in any sort of containment or control program or even eradication program right now. So the wheel's just being let, let go to do whatever it likes. So curiously, the weevil has been trapped in Yuma, Arizona and in Los Alamos in Texas. No populations have yet established in Arizona or Texas. Uh, the source of those weevils is unknown. 
but given how far those weevils can fly, <laughs> especially uh, the captures in Yuma, Arizona, it's possible that they could have uh, originated from along the uh, border with, with Mexico. Okay, uh, this question goes back to one you answered earlier on the males and females in the traps. So why would there be any males in the traps? Yeah, well, I guess some males just don't want to miss out. <laughs> so if they can smell the aggregation pheromone, they think there's going to be food and mating there. <laughs> they, they show up. Okay, um, in its native range, the palm weevil usually does not kill coconut palms. So what do you think is the determining factor for these other species to succumb? Yeah, so in the native range, uh, South American palm weevil is considered probably the number one coconut palm pest. So it is a pretty significant problem in the native range. And part of that problem is amplified through its ability to vector red ring nematode. And here in California, we don't have coconuts, but we have Canary Island date palms, which they really like. And these palms have no evolutionary history with a big aggressive palm weevil that feeds on their uh, meristematic tissue. And even in areas where um, palms and South American palm weevil are native and have co-evolved together, the palm weevil still seems to be able to kill those co-evolved hosts. But you know, coconuts are supposedly a good, good host for it. And I've read articles about uh, South American palm weevil getting into Manzanita down on the Mexican Riviera and just doing a, a huge amount of damage to ornamental coconut plantation uh, plantings in those tourist areas down there. Okay, uh, in raising candidate parasitoids, parasitoids for a new pest threat, do you use the host pest or an alternate to rear the parasite uh, larvae? Yes, so uh, we do all the work on the target host. So the work that we're doing with the egg parasitoid for spotted lanternfly is being reared on spotted lanternfly eggs in the quarantine facility at UC Riverside. And we do that in two ways. We have a small spotted lanternfly colony going in quarantine. And then each uh, spring, uh, Francesc, the postdoc in my lab, he goes out to the East Coast for about seven to 10 days and he collects thousands of spotted lanternfly egg masses. They're very easy to collect because a lot of the forest trees are just covered in these egg masses. And those are moved under permit back to the quarantine facility at UC Riverside. And those eggs are used for rearing the parasitoid and for running experiments. And that video that you saw of us in Arizona, we were out there looking for native lanternflies and we have a couple of colonies of native lanternflies going in quarantine now. And we're interested in knowing whether or not the Chinese egg parasitoid that attacks spotted lanternfly will attack the eggs of our native lanternflies. And before we started this, I had no idea that Southern Arizona, those sky islands, the Chiricahua Mountains, for example, are a biodiversity hotspot for lanternflies in the US. So a lot of work has, needs to be done on those native lanternflies. There are several new species were found. They have to be described. Their host plants were not known. That's why we were fogging those native trees, the oaks and the junipers, and collecting the nymphs off them. And we've just finished doing the DNA testing on those nymphs now. And we hope to be able to match that DNA with the DNA of the adults. So then we will know which species of immature lanternfly are associated with those native host plants. So that's part of the safety testing that we're doing. And as you can see, this takes a long time. You know, we can only get out to Arizona once a year, these lanternflies, breed once a year and we have to be there when they are flying and we use the black lights to attract those adult lanternflies. We catch them, keep them alive on those cages that we put around the branches, get them to lay eggs and then bring those eggs back to Riverside for our experiments. Okay, just a couple more here. Sure. Um, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right. This is our percussion traps, the palm oh, yeah. weevil traps, a better trap and are they commercially available? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, percussion traps are a cone-shaped uh, trap. They're black. They sit on the ground, and they are far superior to the bucket trap. They are commercially available. There is a company in Riverside called Iskatec, which sells them. Uh, they donated their percussion traps to us uh, for the experiments that we did because we wanted to see whether or not they work better than the bucket trap. So they work much, much better than the bucket trap. They catch about five to six times more weevils. And we set up video cameras around the traps to figure out why that is. 
And what we observed was really, really interesting. The Pacusan trap has one entry in and out, and it's shaped like a funnel. And once the weevils go down the throat of that funnel and into the trap, they can't get out. So about 93 to 95% of the weevils that enter the trap, enter the Pacusan trap, uh, they can't get out again. So they're, they're stuck in there and they die. What the video camera showed us with the bucket trap was fascinating. The weevils land on the bucket trap. They walk all over the bucket trap. They go in and out of the holes and about 70% of them fly away. So the capture rate for a bucket trap is only around 30%. The other thing that the video showed us was that weevils will spend you know, 20, 30 minutes, maybe more than an hour at a bucket trap, walking around, walking in and out of it, and then some get captured and then some, most of them fly away. With the Pacusan trap, the weevils arrive at the trap, they walk up the cone, drop in the hole, the entry port at the top, and that whole process takes about three minutes. So Pacusan traps, are much more effective. And if you are going to be monitoring for South American palm weevil, we strongly recommend that you use those Bacusan traps. I think they cost about 20 bucks each. You know, we've had them out under pretty serious environmental conditions for a year and they've, they've, they've held up for at least a year. Uh, we replaced them after year one because Iska was going to give us some new ones, but you can probably get a year or more out of them. The other thing about the traps, which is really important, is that you should put them in partial or full shade. If the traps that are loaded up with the pheromone and the bait are placed in full sun, they don't catch as many weevils. And we think the reason for that is that uh, the traps get too hot on the inside, deactivates the pheromone and probably shuts down the fermentation process of the bait. So putting your traps in partial shade or full shade is, is a good, good practice as well. So use Pacusins, use the pheromone, use fermenting bait, um, dates as a good bait, and then put your traps in the shade. Okay, uh, this is the last one I have in the Q&A. Um, okay. So this is just where can we send photos of fruit damaged by bacteria or viruses or pests to get an ID? Uh, right, so um, I can't really help with that sort of stuff. Uh, if you catch some weird bugs on your fruit trees, you could send me those photos, but pathogens that are destroying your fruit, yeah. If Ben Faber's here, send them to Ben Faber. <laughs> Corporate Extension, Ventura County. He can help you. <laughs> okay. I I... County Agriculture of, of... Yeah, you could send the Ag, County Ag Commissioner as well. That would be a good place to, to go as well. And I, I do have a question because I had here a back, uh, backside communication with one of the participants. Could you talk a little bit more about how the red ring nematode lives? We think about nematodes usually about soil-borne mm. pathogens, but yeah. this one really lives in the palm, right? Yeah, it does. So the, the nematode lives in the palm tree, and I'm not sure exactly what it's feeding on in the palm. So I haven't done a lot of research into how that nematode makes a living in the palm tree. So I really can't answer that question. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I don't really even know, I found no good explanation as to why it causes that red colored ring in the palm. And I've also talked to some folks that have worked on red ring nematode uh, back in the Caribbean area. And they have told me that, you know, when coconut palms go down with red ring disease, it is not a, that red ring is not a symptom that you see all the time. So it seems to be, potentially seems to be a visual symptom that you may see occasionally, but not consistently with palms that have been killed by red ring disease, but it makes a very strong uh, graphic. So yeah, I can't really answer that question, sorry. And related question to that, you mentioned a coconut plantations in Mexico. What yeah. was the place? Yeah, so that was Manzanilla. Manzanillo. In Rio, Riviera, and they weren't like commercial production areas. These were ornamental plantings of coconuts that had gone up in the touristy zones to beautify the hotels and parks and along the uh, coastline there. And I guess South American palm weevil got there about 15 years ago or something now and really knocked back a lot of those coconut palms. There was a lot of um, reporting on that in some of the uh, local Mexican newspapers, and I was able to bring that up on Google News and, and read about it. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Okay, and I think that's it. Um, so thank you everybody who's still holding on there to get all those last questions in. Um, thank you, Mark, for presenting and staying on and answering yeah, everybody's no question. And okay. we'll see you all back at the next one, I hope.
All right. Very good. Good right, afternoon, thank everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.